Hey, Dave Politis, k Missing Project. We're uh, here indoors right now. It is a brisk 21 degrees outside Montana, and the adjusted temperature with uh, the wind is 9 degrees. So, uh, well, I learned long ago, when it hits 10 degrees or less, it's not fit for man or beast. And that's the time you don't go outdoors. And I, I, I won't. So, uh, I mean, I've skied my whole life, and usually it hits like 15, anything less than that. I'm, a, I'm too weak, I won't go, but uh, right now it's cold. So uh, we're going to talk about something today that is probably going to be one of my longer videos I've ever made on one of the most complex series of cases I've ever spoke about on this channel. And uh, right now I want you to go get... One of your favorite drinks, whatever that might be, take a restroom break, put me on pause, then come back and be ready for a mind-blowing experience. So pause it, come back, and we'll talk about it. So what I want to first talk about today is a mailbag letter that I got this morning. And a long time ago, I've talked to you extensively, many times, about personal locator beacons. And that's the same sort of device that you would see, say, uh, on Deadliest Catch on that show. It's an EPIRB device, and it sends a message up to a satellite, and they'll find you. Now, that's personal locator beacon and EPIRB are essentially the same thing. One's for water, one's for land. And I've also talked to you about uh, sat phones, satellite phones. I carry one of those with me every time I go backpacking. And it's a, it's a little better in that it's a phone that works off the satellite. My sat phone actually has uh, a personal locator beacon built into it. And I've told people that, you know, really that's better than uh, personal locator for many reasons. You can call your family, give them updates on where you are. You can call search and rescue, tell them exactly where you are in your condition, etc and then keep talking to them as they're coming in. Now, I get letters every once in a while that make this all worthwhile. And this is one of them I got this morning and I need to read it to you. It says, Dave, this is a pretty informal email. I just wanted to say thank you. I'm currently stuck in Bozeman, Montana, by the way, a beautiful town because of snow. Yeah, we have it here. A semi was passing me in one of the gust zones and when he made it past me, I was not prepared for the gust after and ended up off the road with no traction. Let me tell you something. When you're driving in Montana on the highways, you guys in the lower 48 states are not used to driving up here. Why? Because the speed limits on the freeway are 80 miles an hour. It's fantastic. And uh, when the roads are slick and a big semi goes by, it's just gonna blow you off the road. So don't drive in the winter conditions without good tread on your tires. Back to the letter. No harm came to the car or myself, but I was stuck and in a dead cell zone. But because of watching your videos, my emergency kit was packed with a sat phone, emergency beacon, food rations, emergency blankets, and a couple of quilted blanket blankets, along with a first aid kit. Fortunately, the sat phone worked fine. A tow truck came out and got me back on the road and guided me to the rest of the way to Bozeman before the storm, the big storm, came in. Now I am safely at a hotel waiting to be able to move on again. Reading your book, thinking if needed, I was prepared to wait anything out until help could get me. Six months ago, before I discovered you, I maybe wouldn't have had blankets, snacks, etc. The work you do isn't just about exposing the NPS for negligence or a downright cover-up and conspiracy. You're making travelers and outdoorsmen more prepared for survival. Maybe I could have, could have ended up like Aaron Hedges. I know that's a stretch since I was driving on the 90, but something to appreciate for sure. Thank you, David, for teaching me things I never knew or thought about, and now I'm safe to return to my children and wife. I'm going to spend the storm catching up on your book. If I ever meet you someday, I hope to have it with me so you will sign it. Sincerely, Chris. Chris, I know you're probably still in Bozeman. That downtown area is one of my favorite of all cities in Montana. 
bunch of good restaurants, a great sporting goods store. And uh, I've always liked Bozeman as a city because the area south of there is fantastic. And if you like to fish, fish, the Sims Factory Store south of Bozeman has the greatest, greatest apparel and fishing supplies I've ever seen anywhere. And that is not an ad for Sims. I'm just telling you a fact. By the way, I've never done an ad on this channel for anything, so just wanted to tell you. So that's a letter. Things like that make me feel good that somebody's listening and I'm making a difference out there. So thank you. I got a lot of letters about Holly Cortier, who was missing in Zion. Let me explain something. I get contacted on, on many missing person cases. And many of those, I get asked for confidentiality. And I'll never talk about them. I believe that if you, if you violate a confidentiality, verbal or written, you're an idiot and you're worthless. And I would never do that. And if a family asks me for confidentiality, they've got it and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about what they gave me. Now, on Holly's case, <clears throat> this is something that I think we should all understand about many missing persons cases. I'm going to read you a news brief about this. It says, Sister of Missing Zion Hiker says her survival without food and water was a miracle. <clears throat> Holly Cortier's sister said there is no reason she should be alive after Cortier survived 12 days without food and water in Utah Zion National Park. The sister of the missing hiker who survived 12 days without any food or water said her survival is nothing short of a miracle. Holly Suzanne Cortier, 38, was, a, was found by a visitor who alerted park officials on Sunday after the LA woman was reported missing since October 8th inside the 229 square mile park. Jamie Strong, 41, spoke today about the Cortier endured her current physical and mental state and the joy and concern she felt when she first saw her sister. It's Jamie Strong. I think God got her through this, Strong said. I think it's a miracle. I truly believe there's no reason she should be alive. It doesn't make sense. She doesn't have the proper gear and she didn't have food or water. So let me say, surviving without 12 days without food, 90% of us could do that without a problem. We have a lot of extra gear, if you know what I mean. Surviving 12 days without water, I think this is the first time I've ever heard of that. And I'm not calling her out on it. I'm just saying that this could be a record. The uh, usually three or four days is going to do it for you. There are many, many cases where people survive much longer, no doubt. But 12 days, that's a long time. Now, okay, I'll just keep reading here. Strong said her sister lost between 15 and 18 pounds after not eating or drinking. In addition, Cortier had not eaten for a few days prior to going to the park because she had gone on a plan fast. When I walked in the room and saw how emaciated she was, I lost it, Strong said. It was like seeing someone who had aged 30 years and 12 days. It was horrific. But at that point, I was so happy to see her, it didn't matter. Cortier's daughter, Kaylee Chambers, said in a statement to NBC News on Tuesday that her mother stayed near a riverbed, but Strong clarified that Cortier didn't actually drink any of the water in the river other than wetting her lips and spitting it back. She said she didn't have anything to drink at all, Strong said. She was very well aware of the toxins in the river. This was a statement made that she had set up camp because she didn't want to stay that close to the river. But we were never implying that she drank the water. Cortier has checked herself into a mental wellness facility since being rescued, according to her sister. She had planned to be in the park only a day or two for a journey of fasting and to disconnect from technology without a cell phone while reading her Bible. I don't think that her mental state was good. When she went in the park, Strong said, I really think she had a mental breakdown and what was not in the right state of mind when she decided to take this journey and not tell people where she was going. Cortier kept track of her days by marking them with a Sharpie on a tree. The article goes on to talk about she lost her job beforehand as a au pair. She was kind of down and uh, she was eventually found alive. I would say that's a miracle. Now, one thing about Zion that I sort of knew about when I first heard this case is that Zion is one of those weird parks. I don't have one case there. I've never found a case and I've looked. 
Um, there's a lot of missing people cases, but none that fit our profile. <clears throat> now, why is that? Don't know. That's why when I heard this case, I followed it and other things evolved, but I kind of knew that it would be unusual that this turned out to be one of our cases. So now, what are we going to talk about? Well, first of all, that was Holly. Say your prayers because she was found. Thank goodness. Now, <clears throat> I've written a lot of cases about Washington State and Canada, specifically British Columbia. Now, the British Columbia region is the largest portion in my book, Missing 411 Canada. And that British Columbia area right near the water in the U.S. border has a ton of cases that all match our profile. Now, if you can just go south along the Cascade Range, Washington has a lot of cases. Now, a lot of, of you don't address this, and you probably wish to ignore it. But all of those cases, their proximity to water is really close. And where these people disappear, lots of lakes, lots of rivers, lots of streams. And as I've stated, I do think water is one of those primary indicators on many of these cases. So what we're going to talk about is a series of cases that go from north to south. And that's just the way I'm going to hand them, hand them to you. And they deal with disappearances of people under very unusual conditions. Now, if you look at the screen you're watching now and it says description of video, if you click on that, you're going to get the links to our websites, links to watch our movies, links to email me. I cannot believe the number of people that have watched my videos and say, oh, uh, where do I read more about missing people on your website? Uh, what's your email address? People. That is the location. And you can get there anytime, anywhere, in any of the videos. So, let it be. Now, the first case I'm going to talk to you about is a case that happened August 23rd of this year. And the gentleman's name was Ali Naderi, N-A-D-E-R-I. That is Ali. He's Persian. The man hiked every week, sometimes two to three times a week. And he lived in Coquitlam, BC. And he liked to go to a place called Eagle Mountain, not far from his house. And he'd park in a neighborhood, he'd go up for four or five hours, hike all through the mountains. Now in December of this last year, I was there for two weeks. And I was there for a multitude of reasons, all of them work related, and all of them related to missing people. The area in those woods is really thick, really lush, and we never saw a lot of wildlife, which is weird. But it's on the verge of the city of Vancouver and the suburbs of Vancouver are right there. And you think, how can these people be disappearing right there? And then people are going to say, oh, it's a serial killer. Uh, no, it's been going on for decades. Now, what happened was, Ollie went up on this trail. People in the neighborhood noticed his car didn't move. They called the RCMP and they started to search. Canines. 100 different searchers searched for six days and they didn't find anything. Now, the, the British Columbia Department of Natural Resources had put up a game camera and they captured Ollie on this game camera hiking up the trail and that's him. Now, one of the things I noticed about this picture is that he didn't have a backpack. So he wasn't getting he wasn't going to stay overnight, but everybody knew that because Ali was just a day hiker. And he wasn't going to go that far, knowing he's going to be on a day hike. 
There's seven lakes on that mountain in the area he was going. 2,400 man hours were given to this search. They didn't find anything. And remember, in that picture, he was carrying walking sticks. They would have found those. They knew exactly where he was last based on this picture and the trail camera. So they put the dogs right there and they started searching and they didn't find him. This area is a cluster zone of missing people. And in that Missing 411 Canada book, we, we include a large driving map with our clusters in it. And you'll see, this is a bizarre area. Very scary, actually. And one of the more scary, large areas I've ever documented. Now, going forward. So that happened on August 23rd of this year. On October 10th of, of this year, about a month and a half later, a 25-year-old man named Jordan Naderer, N-A-T-E-R-E-R. -E -E you got Naderer and Naderi. Jordan was a 25 years old, electrical engineering graduate from the University of British Columbia. A very smart kid. Grew up in St. John, Newfoundland. And uh, he left his downtown Vancouver residence on October 9th drove over to E.C. Manning Provincial Park, which is just miles north of the Washington border, and he was gonna take a hike. And his car was parked in the parking lot, and he missed the next day attending a special Canadian Thanksgiving dinner, and it frustrated the heck out of everybody because they knew exactly where he was going they knew exactly where his car was going to be at, and they found all those. Now, his parents flew out from Newfoundland, and this, the search didn't happen too long ago. And I usually don't talk about searches that are ongoing for a variety of reasons. And I know all of you like to ask me about them right away. The first thing I don't like to do is to step on people's toes. And search and rescue personnel are very territorial. Too much so. They're very defensive of what they do, how they do it. They don't want anybody looking over their shoulder. They don't want anybody making recommendations. And I respect that. And I won't do it. But in this case, the hunt's been going on a long time. And his parents appealed to the premier, the premier of Canada, Trudeau. And 22 years ago, uh, Pierre Trudeau's brother, Michel, disappeared. True. Uh, he was skiing and an avalanche came down a mountain and supposedly took him down the mountain into a lake and he was never found. And Trudeau made some public statements that missing people cases troubled him greatly. And when the parents asked for more time to search for their son, uh, Jordan, they got it apparently, and they're still searching today. And in two weeks is a phenomenal amount of time to be searching for somebody in this day and age. Most of the time, search and rescue will give you seven or eight days. Well, I think they're on their 12th day now, and I am all for that. They supposedly sound, found some flecks of clothing, but to not find Jordan is very unusual. Now the next case, very close to Jordan's case. June 5th, 2015, Sukjit Sagu. Sukjit was 20 years old, also from the Vancouver area. Went to a place called Lindeman Lake. Let me catch up with the pictures for you. This is Jordan, good kid. Knows the outdoors, should be found. Say your prayers if, that's inc if you're inclined to do it. So Suchi was at Lindemann Lake and he was with his buddies and he ran ahead of them. And he says, hey, I'll meet you up ahead at the lake. That was the last time they saw him. It was on June 5th. 
2015, about 4.30 p.m. And what is the optimum time for somebody to go missing? Between 4 and 4.30 p.m. This is after looking at thousands of cases. So, friends look for them, can't find them. And they finally caught, get a hold of search and rescue and they start searching. And they put a helicopter up after 20 hours of searching. And they find Sujit's body uh, near an area called Green Drop Lake. They said it's between Lindemann and Green Drop where they found his body. I've said this many times, that just because they find a body, that doesn't end the story. In fact, I learn a lot more from looking at the body and the location and the forensics than I do from anything else. In Sujit's case, the location is bizarre. This is the location where they found the body. They actually found it a little higher up in that boulder field. The search and rescue coordinator on the case was interviewed at the time. The interview's not there anymore. But at the time he said, he just goes, I can't explain this. He was, he was dumbfounded. He was dumbfounded because it was obvious that Sujit's body suffered severe trauma from a fall. But if you look at the boulder field, it's not that steep. So yeah, of course you could fall down from one boulder to the next if you're falling downhill. But it's not like you're falling off a cliff. The other part was, they couldn't understand how he got to the location he was in, why he would go to the location he was at, and why he wasn't found earlier. It's a very perplexing story. And I have a lot of these. And I don't think you could just write it off. Because when a search and rescue commander is confounded about how somebody obtained the injuries they did at the location they were at, people should be listening. And a lot of people aren't. Now, I talked about Naderi and Naderer. Very close kind of names. And those were about 45 days apart. Now, Sukjit's last name was Sagu, S-A-G-G-U. Disappeared June 5th, 2015. Now, about 14 months later, a man named Gordon Sagu, S-A-G-O-O. -O. Now, the difference is S-A-G-G-U or S-A-G-O-O. -O. Gordon Sagu, August 14th, 1960. He was in the Shiam, that's C-H-E-A-M, mountain range at Baby Mundy Peak with a group of friends hiking. Now, Gordon was a personal trainer in outstanding personal shape. And he was with a group of friends hiking. And as they're hiking along, he says, hey, I'm going to go up the trail in front of you and I'll meet you at the car. I'm going to go check out some other peaks too. So he runs down the trail and they all see him. And they figure by the time they get to the car, he's going to be there. But he's not there. Sound familiar? Remember, on Sujik, he runs ahead of his friends, says, I'll meet you up ahead. He disappears, is never seen. Gordon says, I'll meet you up ahead. He's never seen. Separated from a group. Super avid hiker and trail runner. The guy was in shape. He actually was a guy where earlier in life, he weighed a lot more than he did. And now he was in phenomenal shape from British Columbia. And uh, there was a lengthy search. His family, his friends, all went on camera and pleaded for him to come. Now, there's a picture of Gordon. Now, the area he went missing in, no trees, no bushes, it's above tree line. The idea, now, above tree line, Sujik found in an area, no trees, all boulders. The parallels are there. Now, do I think that Gordon was in that range? Well, we've gone through four different summers now where there's been hundreds and hundreds of hikers through that area. He's never been found. I don't know where he went or how he, went, how he got out of there without people seeing him. 
troublesome. So now I've given you four cases. Four cases to Nadiri and Nadir, Sagu and Sagu. I can't make this stuff up. Now, just a very short distance south into Washington from where Sagu and Sagu disappeared, we have the disappearance at a place called Devil's Lake. It's really called Diablo Lake, but the translation is Devil's Lake in the North Cascades National Park. Now, this area of North Cascades, there are grizzly bear there. First case happened April 30th, 2019. And uh, Richie Collins, a 58-year-old man, 20 years in the military, he was a Border Patrol agent, and he parks his car at the Colonial Park campground adjacent to the lake, parks it there. And he was a practical nurse in the Army, frontline command. He was a long time, very knowledgeable person. Just disappears. So they bring in canines. Weather inhibits the search. Other Border Patrol agents come in to help. He's never found. How can that be? They even went a step further. They sent agents to his house in Bellingham, Washington, and they searched that twice, making sure they weren't missing anything, making sure there was no criminal involvement. A neighbor said that they had seen him in the second day of a or the second week of April. Doesn't make any sense. Now, Richie disappeared about 55 miles south of where Jordan disappeared. Keep that in mind. Now, the second case, well, hold that up for a second here. That is Richie. Richie Collins, 58 years old, missing April 30th, 2019, North Cascades National Park. I doubt you ever heard of the case. Uh, October 8th, this year, 2020, a man named Alexander Pish, 35 years old, from Discovery Bay, California. I actually have a bunch of friends living in Discovery Bay. Hello, Dean. And he parked his white Toyota Corolla and uh, right next to the water at Diablo Lake, and he set up an easel. He was painting a National Park Ranger comes by the second day and notices the car's still there and the easel hasn't moved. It was on the southwest side of the lake, very rural. So the ranger, being a smart guy, says, hmm, that's not right. So they start looking around, don't find anything. So they bring in the troops, canines, search for five days extensively, they find nothing. Again, mountain lions and grizzly bear in that area, but if that had been a predation incident, they would have easily figured that out. They didn't. He hasn't been found. That's two people in <clears throat> a matter of a year and a half that have vanished from the exact same location. Exact. So, Northern Cascades National Park. If you go in there, don't go alone. If you go in there, carry a personal locator beacon, tell friends when you're going in, when you're coming out, and carry bear spray. And if you're trained, carry a firearm. Now, that is Alexander Pish, P-I-S-C-H, 35 years old. His car was parked on Highway 20 at Diablo Lake. Friends, I wrote a book called Missing 411, The Devils in the Detail. The cover of the book lists probably 300 locations in North America where the word devil or Diablo is everywhere. Why do locations get that name? How did Diablo Lake get that name? Uh, how many people are really missing in that area over the last 100 years? Well, the National Park Service isn't gonna tell us. We know that. So 
really good questions. Now let's go south. We're going to go south to Mount Rainier National Park. This one case I talked about before, but it's important. And just because I talked about a case once, I'm going to hammer this one home. Vincent G., 25 years old, missing June 19th, 2020, and his car was found in Longmire, just, out, just outside the border, or actually just inside the border of Mount Rainier National Park. He's a smart kid. He had an MBA from Loyola University. He was a Seattle resident for the last year. A lot of the reports say he was a student. No, he was not a student. He already graduated, got his MBA. He worked for a food product company in Seattle. He took the Van Trump, yeah, the Trump, Van Trump Trail toward Mildred Point. It was an eight day search, weather, cold, snow, canines, national park, wasn't found. Now, there were other disappearances in the eight days around Vincent's disappearances. And those two people have been found dead from falls. Remember what I told you about falls. I've told, said this a million times. When I am out hiking alone, and I do it a lot, people, I just can't get people to come with me sometimes. And when I'm out there alone, I am twice as careful as I am when I'm with somebody else. When I'm with somebody else, I know they can call in a helicopter, extricate me, get some help. I'm alone. Sometimes that's not so easy to do, especially if you're unconscious and out of it. So, and I know that these people are smart people. I don't believe that everybody's making stupid mistakes. But Vincent is still missing. Mount Rainier National Park, a cluster zone of many, many people I have written about. It's obscene how many people are still missing in that park and the Park Service will not talk about it and will not list it on their site. I know, I know people say, oh, but the National Park has listed missing people on their site. A very small fraction of the total. They don't want to put the totals up there. Now, this is Vincent. His family has rallied around him. They've asked the Park Service for more help. Good kid. Keep him in your thoughts and prayers. The next case, this is, a, this is really a, getting to be hard around Mount Rainier. And I know people don't understand how dangerous that park must be. Sam Dubal, D-E-U-B-A-L, 33 years old. He was taking the Mother Mountain Loop Trail and he started out on October 9th. He was going to the Monarch Lake Trail. Super experienced hiker, had hiked the Himalayas, extremely good shape. He had gotten hired in June of this year as a professor of anthropology at the University of Washington. Now what you guys don't know, but I did some digging because something just seemed to miss. In 2019, Sam was a visiting scholar to my school, UC Berkeley. And in 2017 to 2018, <laughs> he was a surgical resident at UCLA Med Center. And from 2008 to 2017, he went to Harvard Medical School. Why is this important? I have hammered home the point that one of the profiles is intellects. Sam Dubal is at the extreme end of that intellect quotient. Now his sister, one of his sisters, is a law professor at Hastings Law School at Berkeley. The other sister is a neurologist at UCSF Med Center in San Francisco. The Duballs are brainiacs. Now, that's important to me. Now, the search for Sam is still going on. His sisters have made many, many pleas publicly and to the Park Service to keep the search going. And they're still working at it. Now, he started off on the 9th. He should have been out by the 10th. Who else was supposedly out by the 10th? Jordan Naderer. Two cases within a short period 
or sh short mileage, both gone the same day. Pretty weird, folks. Now, Sam, one of those things that it's unreal that that search is still going on. God bless him. And Jordan's search still going on. God bless him. Keep him going. But there's Sam. And his sisters, Dina and Vina, they keep plugging for him. And if you know anybody who's ever missing and you're a family member, you're all they've got. Trust me. You got to keep plugging away. You got to keep fighting the fight. Because once you give up, that's it. Vina and Dina, keep going. The parents of Jordan, keep pushing. Don't give up. I've heard from too many families that once you leave, that plays with your mind. Walking away, knowing your loved one is there. Can't imagine. Now, I'm going to go over this carefully with you. So this is a map I made up. So Ali Naderi disappeared here. It's 90 miles from where Naderi disappeared to where Nader disappeared. And in between those spots is where Sagu and Sagu disappeared. And then just 30 miles south at D Diablo Lake is where Pish and Collins disappeared. And you travel 130 miles south, and that's where G and Dubal have disappeared. Now, I could fill up this whole ring with people that have gone missing from Mount Rainier. It's insanely filled with bodies. So, all of this area is filled with water. You can see the water, 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 water all through here. And then it follows this. Let's go to something else. This is important to me. Sukjit Sagu disappeared June 15, 2015, 20 years old. Eight miles away and 13 months later, Gordon Sagu, 50, disappears. Now, Ali Naderi, 52 years old, disappears. 90 miles away, and 47 days later, Jordan Nader disappears. Two days and 20 miles away, Alexander Pish disappeared on October 8th. So we've got one, two, three cases within two days. Same location, Pish and Richie over 18 months. And then you got G and Dubal on opposite sides of Rainier in the same park. Interesting part to me is the groupings of the age, 33, 25, 35, 25, 20, and then 50, 52, and 58. Interesting groupage there, all men. But October 10th, October 8th, October 10th. Friends, the part that gets frustrating to me is that the majority of these people are not found. I hope they are found, and I hope that a miracle happens like Holly and they're found alive. Now, nobody in the world has ever done what I've just done for you and put this together so you understand it in a chronological level and a geographical level. And I'm sure, <laughs> another frustrating thing here, I'm sure you're gonna see this put on so many different websites over the next month. And these guys are gonna take credit. Oh yeah, this worker. There's a few out there who actually do give me some credit, but it's more important that the word gets out about this and that people start educating themselves to the fact that hiking alone is not safe. 
And I really don't care if people want to blame animals for it, but I can guarantee that most of these cases that are more than two or three weeks old aren't animal predation. But if they want to blame that, fine. The chances of getting attacked by, a, let's just say, a bear get minimized the more people that are in the group. There's been statistics that show that four people in a group getting attacked by a bear are very, very, very remote. One person getting attacked happens all the time. Well, not all the time, but it happens a lot. But four is that number. Every person that gets in the group after one, the chances go down. Something strange about that. So, tell people where you're going. Check the weather before you go out. Carry the proper gear with you. Carry a sat phone or personal locator beacon. My email's here. Uh, I would appreciate this if you pass this video on to everybody you know, put it on social media to let others understand that this is happening right now. This is a current in process on two of these cases. I greatly appreciate your friendship and your support. And I hope that you and your friends and your family have a safe and productive holiday season. You'll see me in the weeks ahead and uh, I'll try to do more of these videos as we come around to winter because sometimes winters uh, are hard and you can't get outdoors like I can't right now. But uh, this, this took me a long time to put all these cases together for you and uh, I know you appreciate it. So have a good week. We'll see you soon.